Part 3. How do eating disorders present? What are you looking for? What impact do they have? And what does it feel like? Eating disorder is an umbrella term. There are many specific feeding and eating disorders. Here are seven of the most common seen in children and young people. All are serious both in respect to potential physical consequences of the disorder as well as the impact on mental well-being and daily functioning. For the purpose of this training, we will not explore the specific diagnostic criteria for each of the eating disorders depicted, but we will spend a bit of time explaining more about bulimia nervosa, anorexia nervosa and binge eating disorder. ARFID, that is Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder, is covered in part 6 of this eating disorder e-learning package. People with bulimia are caught in a cycle of eating large quantities of food, and that's called a binge, and then trying to compensate for the overeating by purging. Purging can take many forms, including self-induced vomiting, taking laxatives or diuretics, fasting or exercising excessively. People with anorexia are of low weight due to limiting how much they eat and drink. And as well as limiting how much they eat, they may try to lose weight in other ways, such as by doing lots of exercise, making themselves sick, or misusing laxatives. Some people with anorexia may experience cycles of binging, so eating large amounts of food at one time, and then purging. People with anorexia often have a distorted image of themselves, seeing themselves as larger than they really are and they experience a deep fear of gaining weight, which drives them to lose as much weight as possible, even when they may be already very underweight and experiencing difficulties as a result of this. Sometimes weight loss behavior, such as exercise, may be obvious. However, there may be less obvious behavior, including extra trips up and down stairs, jiggling legs up and down, or not wanting to sit down, offering to run errands, running places instead of walking, and this is all to burn energy. Binge eating disorder is not about choosing to eat large portions, nor are people just suffering from overindulging. Binges are very distressing. During a binge episode, people often eat much faster than normal. They eat until they feel uncomfortably full, eat large amounts of food even when they're not physically hungry. They often eat alone due to feelings of embarrassment, guilt, disgust and shame at the amount being eaten. And while binge eating disorder can affect anyone, the condition tends to be more common in adults than in younger people, often than starting in someone's kind of 20s or older. And it may develop from or into another eating disorder. It is normal for all of us to find comfort in food. Emotional overeating is considered an eating behaviour and not an eating disorder. Although there is a great deal of variation from person to person in terms of how somebody with an eating disorder might think and feel and behave, there are some common threads that we might recognise. Those common threads include the fact that this is not something that generally comes and goes. One of the things I've learned from the eating disorders clinicians that I've worked with is that you may have disordered eating at a certain point in time because of your emotional state or your situation at that point in time. An eating disorder is what we call pervasive. In other words, it's there all of the time. It is a constant battle in the young person's mind. They are constantly having an internal narrative relating to food or relating to self-worth or relating to body image or relating to what they need to do next on the basis of what they've just done. And this pervasiveness is something that's deeply distressing for the young person but also deeply distressing to watch because it is there 24-7. I've come to realize that when I talk to a young person with an eating disorder and I just think, oh please, can't you just eat that biscuit? What is a better question is to imagine something that I might be really scared of and not only imagine trying to handle that thing, I might be scared of spiders. So this is not just about handling a spider if I'm scared of spiders. It's about physically eating that spider and it's also about physically doing that when I don't want to, I don't see the need to. 
So when I see somebody who cannot bring themselves to even eat an apple, and I just can't imagine why they would do this thing, it's helpful for me to take a step back and remember what it would feel like if I was pathologically scared of apples and I didn't want to learn to not be scared of apples. And I think this is a really helpful way of thinking about it because it allows us to stay with that young person through the, the nightmare that is every meal, every snack, every drink potentially. What we find with the situation is because they're so pervasive, they start behaving in ways that are deeply atypical, not just for any human being, but for that young person. And one of the very distressing things for the parents and people who love a patient or a young person with an eating disorder is that they start behaving in ways that are very unusual for them and that they know to be wrong. They might start lying, they might start hiding food, they might start doing all sorts of things that they know to be wrong and are deeply out of character and yet they can't stop themselves from doing those things because it is this pervasive need to limit your calories or limit or control what you're eating or what you're doing. And therefore what you start seeing is this constant battle with what I'm doing at this moment, how am I going to manage this? The challenge for parents, for people who are caring for the young person, is it's very easy to start making deals. Please eat this thing. If you eat this thing, we can do that thing. And you start finding yourself making deeper and deeper deals. You start bartering, you start negotiating. And you're not negotiating with a rational person. You're negotiating with an illness that is trying to kill the person you love. And this is a very, very distressing situation for everybody because what happens is you start finding that these deals might become more and more extreme and more hard to explain to anybody else. Born out of the best of intentions, born out of love, but manifesting as more and more unusual behavior, not just by the young person, but the people around them who love them and care for them. Now we're going to hear from some young people who've got lived experience of eating disorders to help myth bust some common stereotypes and assumptions that we often hear associated with eating disorders. So a really common stereotype is that people with eating disorders are very thin and underweight. In my experience that is completely not the case. Um, even from my own journey there was a period where I was very thin. However, that wasn't me, my whole illness. I was only at that stage for a very short amount of that time. Most of my illness was kind of for a healthy weight or getting towards a healthy weight. It didn't invalidate the fact that I was still sick and it didn't mean I wasn't any less deserving of help. I still had anorexia, but just because I wasn't very, very thin didn't mean I didn't have it anymore. Yeah, I don't agree with this. I think Eating disorders are definitely, they're mistaken for being a physical illness when they are definitely very much a mental illness. So it doesn't matter really how you look or how much you weigh. It's more what you're going through in your mind. And I think when people think that, you know, you have to be skinny to have an eating disorder, that only perpetuates your need to be skinny because if you want people to kind of acknowledge that you're suffering, you you feel that you need to be that weight. And it's just not true because it's definitely all in the mind. Often a lot of people assume that people with eating disorders don't like food or don't eat. That's completely not true in my experience. I think there was definitely a time when I found it hard to accept that I liked food and like with my mum, for example, I'd say like, or even when we were making the meal plan, for instance, and foods would be suggested, I'd be like, no, I hate it. It's like disgusting. And that wasn't the case. I just kind of got to the point. And with the eating disorder, it got, it kind of told me that I didn't like those foods to the point. I didn't really know what I liked anymore. Um, as I started to recover, I began to explore food again and kind of try food again. Um, 
and I began to fall in, fall in love with it again. Um, it took a while, but through the kind of the support I had, it did improve greatly. Yeah, this, um, yeah, for me, I, I'm a massive foodie. Um, I've always loved food and when I had an eating disorder, I only loved food more. Um, I was obsessed with food, it was all I th thought about, all I wanted to do was eat, um, but I couldn't bring myself to eat and because I couldn't eat, my need to eat and my absolute obsession over food increased. Um, so yeah, I think you can, you can love food and still have an eating disorder, definitely. So the next myth is one that's actually really unhelpful and quite dangerous, and that is that only girls can have eating disorders. Obviously, I'm a girl, but that's really not true. Actually, when I was in hospital, I met a couple of um, young boys with eating disorders. Um, so that definitely isn't true. Unfortunately, I think there is a greater proportion of women that are kind of seen with eating disorders, whether that's due to kind of the stigma surrounding it and the kind of the ability to kind of access help. I think women and girls are kind of more, I guess, lucky in that way that they can access that help more easily than boys and men. Um, but the men absolutely do have all kinds of eating disorders and are just as important and complex and severe as women with eating disorders. Yeah, it, 100% not true. It's it, uh, like eating disorders can happen to anyone. There's a stereotype that it has to be, I mean, a, of course, a girl, often young women, often white women, but it, it can be anyone. Like it's not always a thing of needing to be a certain weight because to fit into society, it's not always that. Sometimes it's a control thing and any anything can affect you in a way that makes you have an eating disorder and it, it doesn't matter who you are, it can affect anyone. Another myth which is also really unhelpful and really damaging is that eating disorders are a choice. They really are not a choice. I didn't wake up one day and be like, oh, I'm, I'm going to have anorexia. That's not how it worked. Um, it's quite a gradual process, like it doesn't happen overnight, it kind of is a lot of kind of different events and things, or it was for me at least, that kind of influenced my eating disorder and kind of crept up to the point when it was actually a full-blown eating disorder. Um, but still I didn't choose to kind of have that, um, at no point did I kind of actively want to, there were definitely things that influenced kind of my eating disorder, like I wanted to be thin, for example, and for me being thin was very safe due to my experiences. For me, it felt like it, people wouldn't hurt me then, um, but I didn't choose to kind of starve, starve myself to the excess that I did because like, I chose the initial steps to start dieting, for instance, and I made the initial choices to kind of cut things out my diet, but I never intended it to go to the extent it did, I never intended and chose to go into hospital, for for example, and get that sick. Um, once anorexia or any eating disorder really gets so entrenched in your mind, it becomes very hard to make any choices, really. It's so overwhelming and powerful that you, you do lose a complete sense of who you are and you don't know what you like and who you are as a person anymore. So at that point, any choices you make well, you can't make any choices, like you're not in any fit position to make any kind of choices. Anorexia completely, or any eating disorder completely runs the show. Yeah, um, eating disorders are never a choice. I can't imagine anyone waking up and deciding one day that they'll have an eating disorder. Um, I remember wanting so badly to be normal again and thinking that it wasn't possible and I compare an eating disorder to a disease or a drug addiction it's not something you want to have it's something you rely on and you can't imagine your life without but it's definitely not something anyone would want for themselves. 
Another myth that we often have to dispel is that parents are to blame for a young person developing an eating disorder. In my experience, I think parents blame themselves a lot. Um, I've met a lot of parents in my own parents, for, for instance, um, put a lot of blame on themselves. They thought it was kind of their own fault and parents I've met since kind of have similar feelings, but that really is not the case. They are very important though in the recovery of an eating disorder. I don't think I would have, I don't even know if I would be recovered if I didn't have the family and the kind of support I did. Um, so I am very lucky and very grateful to have had them. I don't think any one person could be blamed for someone developing an eating disorder or any one thing. Eating disorders stem from so much in your life generally that, you know, blaming one person, blaming parents, like blaming upbringing isn't enough. I I mean, I can only speak for myself, but I grew up in a very loving household with amazing parents. Um, and I can never could never dream of blaming them for my eating disorder. That's it's something that's so kind of individual that I don't believe that any one thing or any one person could be the root cause of an eating disorder. So I often hear from young people that I work with and also it's a real worry of families that people with an eating disorder can't recover. That's absolutely not true. I have recovered. I've been recovered for like a year and a half, maybe. I'm not 100% sure. Um, it's a long journey and unfortunately there isn't a kind of you, you don't know when your recovery is going to be. It's not like a physical illness or a physical problem where it'll be like, yeah, by like in six months you'll be fine. Like that's not how any mental illness works. It's something that takes a lot of time and a lot of commitment and you have to fight it every single day. So it is exhausting and draining, but it is incredibly rewarding to see those little steps and to be more comfortable comfortable as I started my recovery journey and seeing those changes you know feeling more comfortable seeing my friends for instance eating other foods it was incredible and it was so motivating um, and it is absolutely possible. Um, people can definitely recover from eating disorders um, it's not, I mean, obviously, it's not always going to be easy, um, but I'm here and I consider myself recovered, definitely. Um, it's it's a lot of work and it might feel definitely to the sufferer that it's not possible. Like, a, so, so many times I thought to myself that I would never recover. Um, but I think seeing other people who had recovered, knowing that it was possible, if I put in the work and I believed and I I really, really wanted it, then, you know, I, I could recover and you absolutely can recover if you, you know, put in the right, the right coping mechanisms, mechanisms, the right coping, me if you put the right coping mechanisms in place and have people supporting you and work really hard for your recovery, it can definitely happen. Thank you to our young people who've shared their experiences of what it's like living with an eating disorder. An eating disorder, any eating disorder, can have a profound and devastating impact on a young person as it can impact on virtually every area of their life. Understanding the impact of eating disorders can have is really important. It's not just about finding food hard. We're now going to consider six of the key domains of a young person's life and the impact it can have. So education. Missing lessons for appointments or having to miss larger chunks of time from school is really tough. Young people may miss out on the social and relational aspects of school such as attending trips, clubs, having fun activities and sports, as well as just hanging out with their friends. And that can add the worry and stress that a young person and their family experience. They may worry about falling behind or notice that they're struggling to keep up. 
And that's particularly difficult at key educational points such as sitting exams or transitioning to secondary school or college. Schoolwork may be affected due to decreased energy levels which impact on concentration and motivation. And those with an eating disorder will experience a degree of cognitive deficit which may impact on their academic attainment. And the longer that somebody experiences an eating disorder, the longer that those difficulties will persist. And there may be a risk that young people will not be able to fulfil their full potential. Time missed from school draws attention and many young people with eating disorders are worried about their peers and their teachers and what they will think and say and do when they do return to school. Eating disorders impact different members of the family in different ways and can impact on the relationship that family members have with the young person. It can be really common for there to be arguments between family members, especially at mealtimes, as you know everybody's feeling a degree of being misunderstood. Um, and due to parents needing to offer more support around meal preparation as well as during and after meals, the young person can feel as though they're not being trusted, which can also be a source of conflict. Young people can often become highly dependent on their primary caregivers for both emotional and practical support. And that can be cons inconsistent or at times seem age inappropriate depending on the situation. For example, a young person might appear really high functioning and independent and autonomous when it comes to studying and their schoolwork, but they may actually need a lot of support to help them to prepare and eat their breakfast. And that might have been a skill that they had mastered and not needed support with prior to becoming unwell. They now may need a lot of support to help relearn this skill. And that can be a tricky adjustment for all the family members to make. Activities of daily living are the fundamental skills typically needed to manage basic needs such as attending to personal hygiene and self-care. And if young people don't have the energy or the motivation, even these basic activities can, be, they can become hugely overwhelming tasks. Daily functioning may be significantly impacted on by development of lengthy routines and habits around meal planning and preparation. And that in turn can impact on the time available for other activities. So the young person may be late or miss out altogether on other commitments. And over time, young people may find that the activities they engage in become more and more limited due to the preoccupation and impact of the eating disorder. And as functioning becomes more limited, that can impact on their confidence in being independent and autonomous. Combined with kind of cognitive de deficits associated with decision making and problem solving, young people can really struggle to develop in line with their peer group in respect to the skills associated with young adulthood. Eating disorders and mental health illnesses associated with physical health complications and consequences. The body requires regular and consistent food, fluid and nutrition in order to function and survive. Both a sudden reduction in nutrition or a more gradual chronic long-term reduction in nutrition can result in both short and long-term serious, life-threatening and sometimes irreversible physical consequences. Signs the body is experiencing some degree of short-term compromise include having low energy, feeling weak or faint, gastrointestinal difficulties or such as constipation or diarrhea, bloated stomach. More moderate signs of compromise include muscular pains, breathlessness, hair thinning, irregular periods, poor dental health. And severe signs of physical compromise include muscle wastage, chest pain, cardiac or heart problems, blood irregularities, brain atrophy, resulting in difficulties with executive functioning tasks such as difficulties with emotion regulation, understanding different points of view, decision making, problem solving. Some of the long-term consequences of eating disorders include infertility, sexual dysfunction, osteopenia and osteoporosis, and those are conditions associated with loss of bone mass and bones becoming weaker. And that happens when the inside of your bones become brittle from a loss or lack of calcium. There's also nerve damage, circulation difficulties and heart damage, amnesia and brain damage, and not all brain damage sustained during periods of prolonged starvation are reversible. 
Essentially, when it comes to leisure activities, the theme that stands out is loss. There are so many missed opportunities socially, so having fun, making memories with friends, missing rites of passage such as going to parties, going to prom, missing enrichment activities, which has a knock-on impact on developing independence and life skills and confidence, missing out on holidays and opportunities to do new and different things, missing out on hobbies and interests, especially those that are physically demanding. And this also limits positive or adapting coping strategies that are available to the young person. Many young people with an eating disorder also experience other mental health difficulties, including but not limited to anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, sometimes known as OCD, and depression. Rates of self-harm and suicide ideation are also highly prevalent. It is not uncommon for a young person to have chronic difficulties with low self-esteem and poor body image. And these difficulties can both precede an eating disorder as well as be present throughout. An eating disorder is a little bit like an octopus. So if you can imagine the octopus attaching the main part of its body to the young person experiencing the eating disorder, so this is where the difficulties may seem most apparent. But the octopus has got eight legs or eight tentacles and each one of those eight tentacles can wrap around family members and friends. And the tentacles can have a different strength grip on different people and will push and pull people around in different directions. So all involved in looking after or supporting a young person with an eating disorder will have their own relationship both with the young person and with the eating disorder. And this is why treatment for an eating disorder in young people involves a systemic approach. So working with a young person and their family and the network to help untangle the octopus and release its grip from all those caught up in its tentacles. Now let's watch this film of Janet, a parent with lived experience who will share more about the impact on eating disorders can have on a family. Hello, my name is Janet. Um, I'm an, a, pa a parent who's had experience of living with a daughter with an eating disorder for over a period of, of four years. As, as parents, when something like an eating disorder uh, comes into the family, um, you do ask so many questions of yourselves in terms of, is it something that we've done? Um, and there's almost, to, accept, to a certain extent, a bit of finger point, pointing. Is it something I said? Is it something he said? Is it something he's done? Is it something I've done? Is it something we've done? And again, after a while, I think we recognise that sort of trying to, I don't know, blame one another was use, was was not helpful but actually coming together and being more of a um a united pair was actually um more helpful but that's not to say it's easy to do because it, it it's it, i found it very emotional i found it incredibly um difficult sometimes to put my emotions aside and if you like not to be the mum but be more of a carer but as time went on I think we both learnt that we had roles to play and I think again it's trying to recognise um, as a couple and if there are two adults and two parents in the house who can who can support um, an individual that's great but anyone who's involved with supporting a child with an eating disorder it's about what strengths can they bring and so we did use the ability that my um, my husband had to be far calmer and to be more um, less agitated so things like meal support with um with with my husband were more successful than sometimes with me because i my head was still full of i've got another child in the house i've got to run the house i've got to work uh i've you know we've been at this for an hour already um and i got i can't spend all this time here alongside her Whereas my husband was more able to put all that other stuff aside and say, 
what he was what his role at that time was to do meal support and whether it took 10 minutes an hour 10 hours he was going to be there come hell or high water so i think it was it's about so as as a, as a couple inevitably it causes incredible um stress on the relationship um, and especially if you're both working, in the end what happened, I gave up work, my husband didn't give up work, um, so I became the prime carer for our daughter. Um, and actually I used to resent the fact that he could walk away, that he could go to work and that um, he had to be completely focused on the job that he was doing so that for 12 hours a day he was leaving the eating disorder behind but for me it was a 24-hour job and that did cause resentment but we talked about it but it was there was nothing else that could be done and it was just that was what it was um, so I think you know an eating disorder can put in immense strain on a relationship and I, I think it's one of the thing the toughest things that a family and a couple have to face They, it, when, they're, when you're a family and sharing the same house, it's like you've got this unwanted visitor in the house. And so everybody sees it, everybody can smell it, everybody can hear it, but a lot of people don't know what to do about it. And as parents, you, you will probably start to do a lot of reading and research and support of professionals, but often you're... Um, brothers and sisters of, of, of your child who's suffering can be themselves really quite frightened because they don't know what on earth is going on with their brother and sister. They might be experiencing them as a completely different character to before the eating disorder came along. So if you have other children in the house, whatever age, and uh, help is offered, whether it be taking them to various clubs, to school, to, to stay for uh, an evening or anything like that, it's really important that their life uh, is maintained as normal as is possible, and that is incredibly difficult to do. But also it's really important that they get one-to-one -one time with you um, as a parent. And if that, and sometimes you have to make that a priority because their lives have to go on um, as much as your child who is, who is suffering. Professionals can have such a um, important role in the recovery of your child, but more so, it's also the confidence that they can give to parents or anyone who is caring for somebody with an eating disorder. It's very easy, um, in my experience, to feel somewhat intimidated by medical professionals who have studied for years and years and years and who know all sorts of things. And here is you as a parent come along and you feel that actually it's also your fault that your child might have had an eating disorder. By the way, it is has nothing to do with you as parents and parenting style. Nobody would choose an eating disorder. It chooses you. But that aside, I think it's as, it's, you know, for professionals, sometimes you can sort of make or break um, a parent's confidence. And the more confidence that a parent or anyone surrounding or supporting someone with an eating disorder has in their ability to support that child, the better. So I think um, one of the things for a professional is to be a is to work alongside the parent as opposed to on the opposite side of the desk and so that it's a it's a collaborative approach rather than feeling um, as a parent that we are inferior to medical professionals. I think it's also important to for, for the medical um, professionals to recognise that when they see a family, they may well be seeing them. They're seeing them maybe for an hour a week, 
maybe an hour a fortnight, maybe an hour a month, or whatever it may well be, or if it's actually in an inpatient unit for longer. But actually, in most instances, it's a, it's a snapshot of the day, of the week, of the month that the family are actually dealing with. So I think, um, and again, I, in my own experience, I've done this. I've, when we've had a session with a medical profession, we've said, yes, of course we can do this. Yes, we can introduce um, additional, um, additional food into the meal plan. Yep, yeah, that's fine, no problem. And that's for that hour. But for the rest of the 23 hours of that day, it's so much harder. And then the next day, it's even harder. And then the day after that, it might even be harder. So I think it's really important to recognise that as professionals, you might see um, families for a snapshot of their, peer, of their time and that they are dealing with this 24 seven. So I think it's really important for medical professionals to recognise that there is life goes on and has to go on around the eating disorder. And it's really tough to try and um, complete all the uh, necessary um, treatment and support that that child really does 24-7 every day. When you're um, a parent and in the midst of supporting um, a child with an eating disorder, it's really easy to get so um, embedded into the eating disorder yourself. And in fact, sometimes uh, you are dictated by the eating disorder because of things that you will or won't say, whether you're starting to have puddings and you've never had puddings before. So it's really easy as parents and as family members to just become really embroiled uh, in the eating disorder itself. And it takes a lot of um, effort to sometimes look outside and see what else is actually going on. It's also really difficult as a parent to recognise that actually progress is being made and your son or daughter is actually um, making progress because it, it often takes somebody else to say to you, well, hang on a minute, last time you spoke, there's no way that they would have been able to have gotten gotten their own snack from the cupboard and now you're telling me that they're able to do that and um, you know that that snack's been eaten. It's really easy just to not recognise what significant progress is being made in the house and even more so when it comes to the process of recovery and maybe dis discharge from um, the professional services. Um, as a parent, because you've been living with this 24-7, there's a huge amount of um, fear about actually no longer being in a service because it's as, as parents, we really see that relationship with medical professionals is absolutely crucial to our child's recovery. And it's a bit like some, you know, your crutch may no longer be there. So how are you going to manage? And I think for parents, that whole process of discharged or, or even fear of what if we have a blip? How are we going to manage? Again, that's really important for professionals to recognise in the parents the amount that they themselves have progressed and how they have managed this horrible illness and have learnt so much and have got so many tools and strategies themselves that they can use to help with their child as they go through different stages of the illness. So again, it goes back to the confidence that you guys, that, that uh, professional um, individuals can give to parents in getting them to recognise their own skills and strategies and confidence and that they know what they're doing and that they've got it and whatever may happen in the future that they have 
the ability to uh, utilise all the things that they've learned, all those tools to, to, to support through whatever that next phase might be. I know from my own experience um, as a parent when my daughter was first diagnosed with an eating disorder, the first, or one of the first things that came into my head was the concerns about, well, hang on a minute, what are we going to do about school? Um, and we've got all these appointments and um, it's really important but because especially in uh, years where there are exams and assessments um, and I think initially it took a while for me to recognise that the importance was not, wouldn't, shouldn't necessarily be on her education but on her health um, and it's, it's something that I would really like other um, parents and other professionals to sort of hear because it's uh, it, it, most of the time my understanding is that you know these kids are bright kids and they will catch up in their education and but they can't stay in school if they're not healthy so their their health is absolutely the first priority and again my experience is most schools are incredibly accommodating in terms of trying to support families who have numbers of um, uh, appointments to attend so as parents those those the priority needs to be on those appointments with cams or with pediatrics with whoever it may well be rather than with the school the school your kids will catch up and there there are all I think one of the things that it's really important to understand um, as a medical professional is how lonely it can actually feel um, when you are caring uh, for somebody with an eating disorder. Um, not only is it from the point of view that many of your friends or anyone in your sort of social network might not understand what it is, well, first of all, what an eating disorder is, secondly, what you as an individual and as a family are going through, and three, the seriousness of that particular uh, disorder, but also recognising that sometimes life is complicated and it might not just be that there is the eating disorder that's in the family there could be all sorts of other things going on whether it be parents aging that need also to be cared whether somebody else has their own health issues and sometimes it's not easy for um, parents to be able to prioritize their own child's health because it may be that their own health um, and their own appointments need priority over and above so I think it's it's again the the need for compassion and understanding and the context in which the the family is operating is is absolutely crucial because most fa most parents will be will do whatever it takes to ensure the uh, the safety and the health of their own children but there's also times when they have to put their own health and their own possibly financial considerations or whatever else that might be going on in their own household need to come to the fore. And I think it's just that understanding and patience that sometimes um, families don't necessarily see the world through the same pair of spectacles that medical professionals might do. They have their own pair of specs and they might be um, seeing things through a different um, different colour, different perspective or even um, a different, uh, it's a different context that they're coming to you in. As a parent I think it's really important to be able to work and understand what your uh, support team and your medical team uh, are, are offering. But it's also sometimes that language becomes a barrier and any profession has its own context and its own language. 
and sometimes uh, it can be quite um, confounding to, to parents when they are given lots of technical terms. Um, it's not to say that uh, parents aren't able to um, understand these things, but often in a state of high level of stress, which I know everyone will be in, certainly the parents will be, it's about being able to uh, communicate in an accessible way. So t talking about things like formulations and talking about um, diagnostic tools and talking about assessments, sometimes these sorts of words really mean absolutely nothing. To, to parents. So it's just about trying to remember that parents are scared because they've never come across anything like that. If it was a broken leg, they would understand that we're talking about plaster and physio and um, x-rays. But when it comes to something like an eating disorder and a mental health issue, it's not that um, the, the, the terms aren't as accessible and as common as we would talk about physical health. So it can be another barrier to getting parents um, on working together with you because of the words that are used. So again, that's just probably one um, uh, ask that just to be con considerate of, especially in, in initial conversations how information is provided and so that it's provided in an accessible way and not using too, too many technical terms. When my daughter was admitted to the uh, paediatric ward in our local hospital um, having gone to the GP because she hadn't eaten for five days and and actually not even drunk for five days um, in ways that was a, initially a relief because it felt like we were able to um, almost hand her over to somebody else to look after but then I think the reality of actually um, a 13 year old being in a pediatric ward who'd not actually ever been to a hospital before um, and, and the fact of, that it was a hospital and that um, there were a, a number of other individuals, other children in the same ward, all, all suffering from all sorts of other different um, issues. So it was, she was terrified, um, having never been in a hospital before, not knowing what actually happened. And I think also the fact that seeing lots of different faces um, was whether it be nurses, support workers, doctors, cleaners, people who would come and bring tea and coffee, was, was really quite um, uh, difficult for all of us. The difficulty that I had was not knowing what role, my, what role I had when she was in the paediatric um, unit. Um, as a parent, because they are terrified and not knowing quite what's going on, you feel the need to actually be by their side all the time. Um, and that, that's not necessarily uh, the right thing to do, but it, it's, it's, it's really hard as a parent to then walk away. Um, I think I was fortunate that there wasn't... Uh, there were a couple of empty beds in the ward where my daughter was, so it wasn't too frenetic. But I only had to walk out onto the corridor to um, see people rushing around and nurses and with all sorts of carts and things. And actually the seriousness of where we were would really hit. So I think it's that re recognition and realisation of you know, this is the place where all sorts of things happen. You know, kids die, um, but kids also get better. But I also know from um, my own experience that probably a paediatric ward isn't the right place for somebody with an eating disorder. It's, it's fine for when there's medical risk and they have to be medically stabilised. But beyond that... 
without s a specific training, it's really hard for uh, the nurse. When my daughter was admitted to um, a psychiatric unit, specialist unit, um, it again was a it was a relief initially, but the the process of then leaving her and then not being able to come back and visit on a regular basis as we had done in a paediatric unit was an incredible shock. Um, the, the admission process is really quite, uh, in my experience, was really quite um, se severe in terms of it's a lot of form filling, a lot of um, almost talking in front of but not to um, the individuals um, and I think the, the actual uh, you, you, my experience was we, we were there for a period of sort of a couple of hours form filling and things and then when she was actually um, taken away that was the bit was really quite hard and then I think also the, um, the the first couple of weeks in uh, in having been admitted really were um, so painful in terms of her uh, distress and my own distress and the number of times I remember just when I we were allowed to visit just. Um, driving the car. I'm not quite sure how I drove the car because I was just in floods of tears every time I left her. Um, but I think maybe my car was on automatic by then going down the motorway. But I think I, I always had to um, placate myself and sort of soothe myself by really trying to say she's in the right place and she's safe. And so that for me was was my go-to in terms of when it, it, it was how I managed my distress. And actually, I also learnt to um, not so much ignore her distress, but to um, not to accommodate it, because, again, it goes back to being too emotional and being too um, uh, embroiled in the eating disorder and allowing the eating disorder to pull my strings. So again, it was it was a pretty tough time for us all, but it was something that I think set her onto the road to recovery. So I would never not have wanted to do it. Dr. Jeanette Treasure, who works at the Maudsley Hospital in London, developed an animal analogy to better understand the emotions and responses of adult caregivers of young people with eating disorders. So whilst we can all feel and behave in many different ways, we will usually have a tendency to lean towards particular reactions. Here we have the kangaroo. The kangaroo symbolises the caregiver reaction of protection. It's a natural instinct to want to problem solve and make better when our children are distressed or facing problems. Adults offering solutions and working hard to protect and shield a child from difficulties or distress works well in the short term, However, this strategy can sort of inadvertently cause more difficulties in the longer term. By trying to solve the difficulties for the child, the child will struggle to learn how to problem solve for themselves or manage and cope with the distressing thoughts and feelings. In many cases, caregivers may find themselves accommodating the illness and being drawn into routines and rituals such as driving around different shops to find specific brands of safe food, chopping up food into small pieces, presenting food in certain ways, or ensuring the household functions in a way dictated by the young person's eating preferences. And these can be really difficult habits to break once they've become ingrained and can cause both the young person and the family significant distress when trying to undo the steps that were originally taken to ease that initial distress. 
Here we have the rhinoceros. The rhinoceros symbolizes the caregiver reaction of behavior fueled by stress and frustration. It is absolutely understandable that when faced with a situation in which someone feels powerless and helpless, such as encouraging a young person to eat who won't eat, that stress and frustration is experienced. However, when this builds up, conflict and arguments are more likely to happen. This then develops an unhelpful cycle. The more a young person refuses or is unable to eat, the more frustrated the adult becomes, the more forceful their attempts become, and ultimately the more stuck both the young person and the adult feels. So what we're aiming for in terms of approach and reaction is to be more dolphin. Finding the balance between taking control and guiding the young person whilst maintaining a caring and compassionate manner. Dolphins support their young by sometimes swimming out front, leading the way, guiding them through safely. At other times they will swim side by side next to their young, and at other times they will swim behind, letting the young dolphins swim out in front leading the way, whilst being there to sort of gently nudge and steer and help to stay on course. And this is true of adult caregiving roles with young people. At certain times, we may need to be more directive and guide the way, whilst at other times we can work together, offering encouragement. And ultimately, we want to be getting into a position to help young people to find their own path and journey, having equipped them with the skills that they're going to need for independent, healthy, happy living. The skill in becoming more dolphin-like is knowing when to lead and offer more guidance and when to step back. Now let's consider emotional responses. So first we have the ostrich. The ostrich symbolizes avoidance. Sometimes when things become a bit overwhelming and we're struggling to cope, we want to sort of bury our heads in the sand and try to avoid thinking about or talking about the problem rather than challenging and confronting the difficulties head on. The downside of this is that the difficulties will remain and potentially become more entrenched. An unwillingness to engage with the process could be interpreted by others as not being interested or not caring, which also can kind of further exacerbate the problem. Um, next, we have the jellyfish, and this represents feeling overwhelmed by intense and distressing thoughts and feelings. And often the thoughts and feelings are linked to parenting skills. So parents may feel highly self-critical and may feel that they're in some way to blame for the difficulties being experienced. So any help or advice or support that's being offered by others may be perceived as a reflection that others are judging their parenting or that they can't cope, which then elicits a very defensive response. And that can lead to a breakdown in communication and joint working, which ultimately can have a detrimental impact on the care that a young person receives. So what we're aiming for is to be more dog-like in our emotional responses. An optimal response is consistently caring, compassionate and calm, regardless of what is going on. The, the loyalty and love that both dogs and adult caregivers should have should help guide responses. We've now completed module three, and before we move on to module four, please complete some feedback by clicking on the QR code below.